Sveiki atvykę į leidiklos Tyto Alba virtualų vakarą. Šiandien jame laukia pokalbės su pasauliu negorso bestselleriu autorė Lucinda Railiai. Jos romanai itin populiarūs ir tarp Lietuvos skaitytojų. Na, geriausiai žinoma dėl knygų serijos septynio seserys. Vasara pasirodė septintoji šio ciklo knyga. Na, o šiandien susitinkame su rašytojai leidiklai neseniai išleidus naujausiajos knygą Meilės Laiškas. Tai 15 lietuvių kalba išleista šios rašytojos knyga. Taigi apie naujausią romaną, apie rašymą apskritai ir asmeninio gyvenimo įtakas kūrybą ir pasikalbėkime. Lucinda Railiai. Good evening, dear Lucinda. Hello. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm sure Lithuanian readers are thrilled to see you. Oh, well... Um... I'm thrilled to see them, even though I can't. So, hello. Um, I've been to Lithuania. I've actually visited um, and um, attended a very big book fair there. So, uh, I didn't have much time as you don't see the country, but what I saw was beautiful. So, um, yeah. Anyway. Speaking of... Speaking of your readers, I've, I have read stories, I have heard stories that your fans were calling the publishing house, uh, anxiously inquiring when your newest book is going to be published. There was even a story of a woman who was eager to know that as soon as possible, since she was uh, worried whether she would still be alive to have the chance to read your book uh, in Lithuanian. How is it to hear stories like that about your readers? Well, I mean, uh, on one level, it's uh, lovely that my readers have come on the journey with me. Um, and on the other level, uh, I um, get an awful lot of, awful lot of uh, emails from uh, older people who maybe are worried, just like you say, that um, they won't live until they see, you know, read the last book. And uh, it's so awful when I have to say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the story. Um, but uh, and on, a, on another level, it's terrifying to think that there is so much anticipation for, for the book. Mm -hmm. Your books are around uh, five pages long and longer. One needs I to have time. You mean <laughs> yes. hundred pages? Yeah. Yes. One needs to have time to write them that long, and a lot of time to read them as well. And you can hear researchers are warning that nowadays people can barely comprehend long texts. Texts they they just go through headlines. Obviously, you you don't think like that. What makes you believe people need long stories? Well, I also think. Uh, excuse me for saying this, but you live in America. And uh, certainly in America, uh, it's a very different thing. And most people only write books there that are up to 400 pages long because they do. The publishers actually believe that people can't concentrate. But um, one of the things that sometimes upsets me is the fact that uh, it will take me all this time to uh, research and then actually write and then edit the story down to the very last comma. And some people can, will let me know that they bought the book in the morning and by midnight they finished it. Um, so, and I'm thinking, my goodness me, all that time I took, you know, please go back and read it again slowly. Um, so I don't believe that at all. I mean, just look at Harry Potter. I mean, you know, huge books. And uh, I think if you're involved in the story, you want it to go on and on and on. So let's talk about your books more specific. Once a year, you publish a standalone novel, which doesn't belong to a series. And here it is, not too long ago, the love letter was published. How would you present this novel briefly? What was the most important uh, in it that you wanted to convey for your readers? Okay, well, uh, number one, I wrote that book a very long time ago um, about... Um, Ah, let me see, um, 21 years ago. So uh, it's actually quite difficult for me to remember that book. Um, and obviously every country is publishing in a different order. So I haven't talked about the, the love letter for a long time. Um, but actually it was, I think it was my first attempt at a thriller. 
um, because I, as a writer, I'm very, very um, convinced that a writer should be as um, interested in the novels they're writing as the reader should be. And so I always want to test myself. And so, yes, I wanted to write a thriller. And uh, that's what The Love Letter is. It is very different from the other books I've written. Uh, and it's a very fast paced, fast moving thriller. And I think because I did write it then, and um, I also wrote a what, what you might call a literary book then when my children were small, uh, which has since actually been published and, and another book, um, I think it was almost uh, training for what I would then eventually end up writing because there is an element of thriller in the, the Seven Sisters series. What actually brought my attention is the fact that you swipe off the dust of the novels you wrote like 20 years ago and bring them back to life and publish now. So why publish it now? Was it something unfinished about it for you? Uh, no, it was simply that I was moving house and I went into the bottom drawer of my desk. And when the children were small, as I said, I had written all these novels just for myself, not, not to be published. And then all my books were doing very, very well around the world. And I happened to mention to one of my publishers that I had these three unpublished novels. And she was just like, oh my God, give them to me. Um, so it was very much uh, the publishers asking me rather than me asking the publishers. And so I was very, very uncertain about it. And I started reading them and I realized that they needed um, editing and they needed updating, um, but that the stories were all there and the characters were all there. So I just thought, why not? You know, why not have them published? They're sitting there written. So, you know, let, let's put them out there. Mm. What makes the story timeless? What do you think? That it never goes out of interest or out of importance in people's lives? Um, well, I think, I think it's the themes that are timeless about humanity. Uh, that's the really important thing. You know, we, we may have changed the way that we live, eat, dress, behave, but we as humans haven't actually changed that much. You know, we still fall in love. Uh, for example, we still have, you know, anger, fear, jealousy. And um, so all those things are in the books I write just as they would be in a Dickens novel, an Austen novel, a Bronte novel, um, you know, they are all timeless themes. In one of your interviews, I remember you mentioned that the main topic uh, of your books is the tension between love and responsibility. Is that correct? Uh, I think that it can be, it's, I, I mean, it's almost in most love stories that I've ever read that there is that thing of um, doing what you want, following your heart at a point where perhaps you're going to hurt other people um, and you have responsibilities to other people. And you then have to make that terrible decision as to whether you're going to put your heart and yourself first, or you're going to put your responsibilities first. And I think you're talking about that quote was from a book called The Orchid House, which was um, a book I published, I, I don't know, uh, 11 years ago, I think. Um, and that is all about that, you know, responsibility versus love. And um, I won't tell you which wins uh, for anyone who hasn't read The Orchid House. So, um, but yes, it's a big struggle. And I think um, it's a theme that goes way back. Uh, into the past and is still there today. Um, you know, people fall in love, you know, they, well, they may get married to one person and then 15 years later, they fall in love with someone else. Maybe they've got children. You know, what do they do? Do they please themselves or do they stick by their family um, because it's best for them? Let's talk a little more about your more recent books when we were arranging the, in, the time for the, this interview. I know you were busy with writing. Is that, is that correct? What have you been I'm, writing I'm recently? Always, I'm always busy with writing, but uh, recently I've been 
very, very busy with um, interviews. So what I what I try and do uh, is I most of my life is writing the books or being with my family, with my children uh, and my husband. And then this month has obviously been set aside to um, do publicity uh, for the world that is publishing uh, at the moment, uh, The Missing Sister, which is the seventh book in the Seven Sisters series. So that's been what I have been doing. But most of the time I am all alone in a tracksuit, or in fact, not even a tracksuit. It's not even as nice as that. A great big, you know, old cardigan with holes in it uh, by myself in Ireland writing, yeah. You mentioned the miss, missing sister, so let's talk about that. Um, it's really good news for the readers, and summer is going to be published. So, would you please give some cues or hints about no. it? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I think the whole point about the missing sister is she is missing, and um, it's very, very difficult doing interviews when you really can't talk about it. And the reason that I don't want to talk about it is not because I'm being a difficult author or, you know, strange in any way, but I just think, why spoil it for the reader, you know? Um, and what I would say actually to anyone who is going to read The Missing Sister is there is a, a very, very big um, ending to the book. And I'd really, really ask and entreat from my heart any reader who does read it to keep the secret and not tell people how it ends and not put it on the internet because it only spoils it for for absolutely everybody um i mean i can tell you that the book is set in new zealand oh well it's set in all sorts of places around the world um because the sisters have to try to find the missing sister before this year anniversary where they're going to lay the wreath for Par Salt, where they think that his coffin was buried at sea. So um, the main body of the story takes place in my home country, which is Ireland, um, and uh, takes us, as they always do, right back into the past. So, and that's really all I want to say you know, as I say, not because I'm being difficult, but just because why spoil it, you know, for a few weeks. Mm. Now, while critics are noticing that not only the location is important in your novels, all the sisters are spread around the world in different continents, but also the deep knowledge of everything you write about. For example, like Italian girl is opera singer. And while reading the book, you can really get to know about the opera behind the scenes how do you manage that that readers can really relive things while reading your books well i do the most enormous amount of research and um i mean i would definitely count myself as an historian because it's such a huge part of the process for me but actually with the Italian girl, it was very easy for me because I grew up in the world of opera. Uh, my, my godfather uh, and uh, uncle was the chief light, lighting designer at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. So, I mean, that was a world that I knew back to front and inside out. Um, so, but normally I wouldn't know uh, the worlds that I'm going into and I have to go to the country. And what I do is I live there for a while, um, not just for a week, not just visiting museums. Um, and I get to know people and it's the actual people who live in the country who uh, are always the key to giving me the story and giving me the research that I need because it's, it's often, you know, it's not just a history date you know, of when a war was won or, you know, ended. It's actually knowing how people reacted on the street to it. Um, you know, the average ordinary person. Also what they ate for breakfast, you know, whether there was electricity, uh, whether there were cars, whether they were using pony and carts. I mean, just taking a character from a hundred years through one day in 
a, a foreign country that I don't know about, you know, is a challenge. And there's, there's 850 pages of that. So it's a huge amount of research. And, and as I say, the only way I can ever really do that is by speaking to the people from the country itself. Hmm. Actually, that's the question I'm very curious about hearing from uh, writers. How much influence does the personal life uh, uh, has on creating? And uh, can a writer write only about something he or she completely invented in the head? Or, or is it inevitable to just really write about yourself, about who you are as a person, as a writer anyway? Well, I think, I mean, given the fact that normally my cast of characters probably numbers up to 100 people, um, I, I think I would be very schizophrenic if I was all those people. But, but I also think that there is definitely somewhere, uh, even if you don't know it, it's by osmosis that part of you and who you are and what you feel and think ends up being, you know, in the recipe of the story. Um, and I don't think you can separate authors from what they write. I, I really, really don't. And, uh, and, and I think if you did, it wouldn't have a heart either. It wouldn't have an emotional heart. And, you know, I pour everything I am, you know, into these books and, it's funny because I often, you know, decline interviews because I, you know, I'd prefer to be writing, to be honest. Sorry, that sounds very rude. And I don't mean it, but, um, you know, because what I feel is that everything that Lucinda Riley is, is in those books, you know, um, everything I am. Is it in a way also like a psychotherapy journey for you? <laughs> uh, I certainly think it's probably kept me out of therapy, but um, yes, I mean, it's a great way. I, I mean, I find writing a great way of uh, letting out my creative side uh, because, you know, obviously I'm a, I am a very practical person. I'm a mother who is, you know, four children and uh, I have to live on a domestic level um on a very practical level and i've done that for many many years so that um the writing is definitely a way of getting uh you know channeling my creative energy which i've always had since i was much younger in different formats so you know i first of all trained to be a ballerina and then by default became an actress and then i've now ended up as a writer so you know, I've got that side to me. I've got two sides to me. One that is very practical, domestic, um, and grounded, and the other side that is creative. How did you end up with writing at all? Um, I was in bed with uh, a very serious virus that they thought was glandular fever, but I was very sick with it. Um, and I had always had a very vivid imagination and um, as you know I had been an actress and couldn't act at that time obviously couldn't get out of bed and so I just thought right that's it I am going to write the story that had been going around in my head um, and I'm going to write it down and so I wrote it down longhand and um, it took me I don't know how many months three or four months and while I was sick and I did, you know, the hours that I could. And then a friend came round, saw this big pile of paper and said, what's this? And I said, I've written a book. And she said, well, I want to read it. And I said, no, you don't. And she said, I do. Anyway, her, um, her father was, was quite a sort of, um, not a well-known, but had won an award for a very famous book um, that I think was called Last Train Out of Berlin. But anyway, it was about, uh, the fact that his uh, his watch was an hour fast, um, that he actually got on that last train out of Berlin before um, the Nazi invasion. 
And um, anyway, she gave it to him. And I doubt he read more than probably two pages because it wouldn't have been his thing. Um, but he gave it to his agent. And suddenly, about a year later, after typing it up and selling my wedding dress to um, pay for this word processor, uh, I had a three book deal. And I knew then I was 24 and found myself newly pregnant as well. And I just decided to write, you know, that's it. Um, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I knew it. What a story. Um, <laughs> how would you describe what uh, being a writer has granted you and what has it deprived you of, perhaps, if there is anything? I don't think it's deprived me of anything. I think it's given me absolutely everything. It's given me such privilege, actually, even though I've had some very, very hard times when, uh, you know, 20 years ago or so, when the books weren't selling very well and, um, you know, we lost our home because we couldn't pay the mortgage. Uh, so I've been very, very poor. Uh, so you could say that that's been very difficult, but nobody goes into uh, the arts to earn money. And if they do, don't, let me tell you. Um, and um, I think it's given me this enormous privilege because I've traveled across the world. I've met people I would never, ever meet. Um, you know, amazing, amazing people who have humbled me. I've heard amazing stories. Um, and I've also managed somehow, uh, even though times have been tough, um, as I just said, you know, to earn a living out of what I love doing and, you know, to wake up every day and to know that I'm going to spend the day doing what I love doing, I think is the biggest privilege that any human being can be granted. I really do. And now all your family members work with you and your books, your family. Oh, so no how way. special is not this family business? Uh, no, no, no. The, um, definitely the dogs don't work for me, although they're thinking about it. But uh, no, not all our family works for, for us. But um, I have my husband, who is my agent, and I have my stepdaughter, who um, is a PA. So that's it. But we've got seven kids and a big family. So definitely not all of us. <laughs> I've heard about the idea of writing books for children together with your son. Um... That's happened. Yep, that's um, they've already been published in um, the first one. It's the series, um, the Guardian Angel series. And uh, Harry and I uh, had our first publication about six months ago um, and uh, it comes, it's just come out in Germany and then I'm doing really well. So that's a really, really nice thing. And then it's out around the rest of the world in autumn. So, and it's a beautiful thing to write with him because it was something I told my children when they were younger that if, and if they were scared and they had a big day, that a guardian angel would be looking after them and you know as I dropped them at the school gates or whatever and I said don't worry you're you're never going to be alone and you don't need to worry about this because your guardian angel will be with you and we were sitting in a pub you know in the old days before coronavirus um about two years ago now and um I just said wouldn't it be nice you know to just write a series of children's stories so that more children could feel protected, you know, by the fact that they had a guardian angel, uh, which I believe in uh, completely. And, um, and Harry said, I think that's such a lovely idea. And so basically I come up with the stories and he writes them and it's the perfect, um, perfect crossover. And it's been really lovely actually to to write with one of my children uh, to do a project with somebody else, because normally, obviously, writing novels is uh, a very lonely experience, which I don't mind at all, but it was a nice change to be with somebody else in a gang together. So what's next? It seems like you're very creative, looking for different ways how to express your ideas, your writings. So well, what's next? Only books, only books is, is what I'm interested in uh, and writing books. But, um, but yes, I 
obviously there is um, a TV series at the moment that's in development. And so I'm involved in that, which is weird because that was going back to my acting days. Um, seven Sisters, right? Yeah, so I mean, it'll, I don't want to jinx it because it takes forever and there's always something that may not happen along the line. Um, you know, when you, when it, but, but actually it is in development now. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed and see what happens. But, um, but no, I will be writing the next book. That is what I am going to do as soon as I finish doing all these interviews for The Missing Sister. So, yeah. I guess our time is running out. So I have the last yeah. question. You mentioned the coronavirus. So here we are speaking, we are talking in the times of the pandemic, how this time is affecting you as a person and as a writer, or perhaps it doesn't have a big influence. How is it for you? Um, I think it's definitely luckily affected me less than perhaps it has other people because I am so used to being in the house by myself with my own company I mean you know I'm never bored because I've always got books to write um so I think really actually the people that I feel desperately sorry for are my teenage children um who you know one of whom was left school in the summer and was going to take a year out go traveling um and instead of which he's been locked up with his mum and dad for the last year. And, oh, I, no. and so, you know, I have two other children who have just started uni. Um, and I think for them, it's been really, really, really difficult. Um, and I have felt desperately sorry for them. And, you know, obviously they've been at home with us. Um, I mean, in a way, I think because we've been lucky enough so far to uh, not be affected um, and have anyone close to us, you know, die uh, or get sick, badly sick from it. I think in a, in a way it's been a sort of, uh, I wouldn't say a bonus, but it's given my husband and I some extra time with the children that we wouldn't have had. So I, I would, always try to put a positive slant on something that has been so very, very negative for millions and millions of people. Um, uh, but I really, really hope that, that the pandemic has taught uh, the human race, you know, that we are vulnerable um, and also that we just need to be kinder to each other and work together um, and the fact that we haven't been able to be in our communities and, and hug and touch and kiss and how you know, valuable and necessary you know, um, it is for uh, humans to recognize they need other humans and to not cut themselves up into, off into you know, a little an internet bubble which was starting to happen um, more and more and more. And, you know, one human alone, um, you know, cannot, you know, be an island. You know, we need to be a community on an island, definitely. Mm -hmm. And if it's not possible at the moment, books comes into help. I've heard that the sales of books went up. So oh, it's a good have. thing for a writer. I mean, it's just been amazing. I mean, obviously, you know, the bookshops themselves have been through terrible times and um, I've tried to do everything I possibly could to, you know, help them by making videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I really do think that people have got tired, I think, of staring at a screen, you know, especially if they're on Zoom all day. Um, and, uh, you know, just actually the simple pleasure of, of opening a book and also getting lost in another world, I think has been necessary. And um, I think the difference between TV and reading is that on TV, you know, you don't really have to try very hard to use your imagination. And if you're not trying very hard to use your imagination, 
then you're not becoming so involved with something as you are when you read a book, because then you can dress the characters, you can imagine that, you know, maybe the romantic hero looks like someone you fancy down the road or, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, you have to work harder, but through working harder, you know, you lose yourself in the story. And uh, I really, really hope that people will continue what has happened during the virus and keep reading because it's just essential to keep the imagination going rather than just having everything presented to you on a plate, which is TV. Um, I know the last question was supposed to be earlier ago, but I feel this is hard to stop for me. Do you yourself read a book? Read books? Oh, gosh, I, I am. I, ever since I've been a child, I, ha, I am a bookworm. I don't know whether you have that expression in Lithuania, but um, I am oh, an incredibly avid reader and always have been. And um, I think the only time that I don't read is when I'm writing my own books because I'm spending so much time in my own imagination. And I'm also terrified that I'm going to steal someone else's storyline. <laughs> so um, that's the only time I don't read. But I'm a huge reader. Yes, I am. Well, thank you so much for taking your time and meeting with us and with your Lithuanian readers. It was a real pleasure to talk with well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, maybe one day, someday soon, uh, we, will, we will get to actually meet in person. Um, and I'll see you soon, Lithuania. See you soon, hopefully, at Vilna's Book uh, Fair, perhaps. Okay. Take care. Thank, thank you very much.